Good morning, Oconto Gospel Chapel. I'm sure you tuned in on WOCO. It's 9 a.m., so I want you to do something. Grab your Bibles. But if you don't have a Bible to grab and you want one, just call the Oconto Gospel Chapel office at 835-2330, and one will be mailed out to you without charge. Well, we're going to continue our series of how to pray. And I found a quote from Derek Prince in his book, Secrets of a Prayer Warrior. He says this, prayer is one of the greatest opportunities, one of the greatest privileges, one of the greatest ministries available to all Christians. I don't read that Jesus ever taught his disciples how to preach. But he did teach them how to pray. And he continues, I believe that everyone who seeks to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, who desires to take his or her place in the kingdom of priests, should seek to learn how to pray effectively. Remember, God not only welcomes you to prayer, he's waiting for you. Isn't that wonderful? He just not only says, hey, come on and pray, but he's, well, he's waiting for you. And that's what we're learning about prayer. So let's seek God. Heavenly Father, we just, as your people, we need to know how to pray. Because you want a relationship with us. You want intimacy with us. You want us to be close to you and us to you. So I thank you for the word of God. Help us understand it. Help us to practice it in our daily life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the disciples, this is how it all starts out, and it's found in Luke 11, 1, said, Jesus, will you teach us how to pray like John taught his disciples? What do you think the master said? He was more than willing to teach us how to pray. He wanted to teach him, teach his disciples how to approach God. And you know, today if you're listening and you don't know how to pray, I would say ask him and, and, and study Matthew chapter 6, the whole chapter. Just study it because you'll learn what it means to pray. He wants you to pray. So he also told his disciples how not to pray. And what was that? When you look at Matthew 6, 5 through 8, he tells his disciples, I don't want you to be like the hypocrites. Now, who were the hypocrites? They were the religious leaders. They were a part of the synagogue. And, and there were some who would just wander out at noon. Let's just say it's noon. More people. He would have a shawl on his head. And he would just preach. And as people watched, it was like a sideshow maybe. People watched this boy, isn't he holy? Wow, I like to be like that. Well, why did they do that? It says, Jesus says they loved the approval of man. And let me just say to our leaders at our church and elsewhere, spiritual leaders, you know, the temptation is, is to want to be approved and liked by people. I mean, that's a natural response. But when it comes to praying, that we just don't want to go on and just keep on, you know, here's all our knowledge. Why are you doing that? I believe sometimes we do it because we want others to think, think of us and think that maybe we're holy. And that's really not what God wants from us. Don't stand out on street corners. Don't stand out in your small group and just constant, just continue to pray and put no period bed at the end of it. Jesus said this about them. Their reward is already there. What was their reward? Approval of men, not God. And that will happen to us. If we're not we're not concerned about it. If we're just doing it because we want approval of men, Jesus says, you have no reward from God. 
Now the second group Jesus points out is that we're not to be like the Gentiles or the pagans. Isn't that interesting? You have the Jewish sect, and here they are is preaching the law, and people are admiring. Here's these pagans, and you would see them there as well, and they would do what? Jesus says they would ramble on with meaningless words. Why would they do that? They wanted to manipulate their gods or God. They would have a long list of the gods so as not to miss any one of them. You know, that could be something we do, that we still do. What do I mean by that? There are churches, organizations that think that they could just continually repeat, 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 and think that God's going to hear them because of their many words. Well, he's not. We have to understand that maybe you do this out of desperation. And we, and we do. It's, there is a good thing about it that sometimes we do repeat a word and say, Oh, help us. Help us, Lord God. Help us. Help me. I've done that. But you've got to be careful that God sees you. He knows you. He knows your name. So you don't have to be desperate or frantic. But I want you to look at the next verse, verse 8. Here is something so awesome. Jesus had given his disciples and to us some very encouraging words. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the pagans. They all received what they wanted. And here's what he says. Your heavenly father knows what you need before you ask him. Isn't it wonderful to know that? To that he knows everything. Why would he say it like that? He says, I want you to rest assured that I know your needs. Now I want you to focus on me. I think that's encouraging. Because he's your father. You can trust him. So Jesus says in these next few verses, 9 through 13, he tells his disciples to pray this way. Now, when you look at Matthew 6, 9 through 13, some of our Bibles title this as the Lord's Prayer. That's a, that, I think, is an error. The Lord's Prayer is found in John 17. This is really called the Disciples' Prayer. So these prayers, this prayer, Disciples' Prayer, has two parts to it. The first part is to God. Verses 9 and 10. The second part has its focus on people. You just have to read through it. Our needs, other people's needs. How we are to take care of forgiveness and so on. We'll look at that next week. So that's what Bound's prayer looks like. God and others both are required. Don't fall into the trap holding on to one over the other. Maybe what you should do is just a little experiment. What is the percentage of your prayers? Maybe you have, you pray to God, and that's great, but that's all you do. You end with prayer to God. Or maybe you're the other side. All you do is pray for others, but you don't focus on God. This is a balanced relationship, as we're going to see next. So the first part of this of this prayer, Jesus is our Father. Why? He wants us to focus on relationships, relationship with him. Remember the hypocrites? Remember the pagans? They weren't focusing on God at all. They were focusing on themselves. God wants us to focus on the intimacy because he is our Abba. Now, what, what, one way you can kind of get this in your mind and in your heart is if you have your granddaughter or grandson or you have your adult children, I would say right now, give them a hug. I know some guys don't like the hug, but do this for me. And, and put all the emotion and love for your child and hold them. 
And you'll see a smile on your kid's face. Or at least they're going to be appreciative that dad loves me. Well, when you think of God as your father, he wants that kind of relationship with you. Not just a mechanical one where you say your nightly prayers, which is fine. But it's mechanical. It's rote. There's no sense of feeling or intimacy. It's just that this is what I do. I have to get it done. Or have meaningless chatter. See, in order to have a relationship with the Father, and he wants you to have that relationship, many don't know Jesus. Jesus Christ needs to be your Savior. The one who saved you from your sins. When you think of the cross, you think Jesus hanging there. You want to know, understand that the wrath of God just came down on Jesus because of your sin. He took it all. He took your sin. Then he died and was buried and rose again. Why? Because he wants you to have a relationship with the Father. And the only way you're going to have a relationship with the Father is through the Son. So God's desire is to have an intimate, close relationship with him, but also with one another in the body of Christ. And sometimes we miss that. Sometimes we just, our independent people come to church. We, we pray, but there's no connection with others in the body of Christ. Now, this is just a word of caution. I don't mean to offend anyone, but I want you to think about this. The Hebrew writer tells us not to forsake our time together in church. Hebrews 10, 24, and 20. You look it up later. But there's, there are those who do. And COVID-19 provided that. Maybe not in the very beginning in March, but I know this, as the month and months wore on, you don't see people coming back to church. They're doing something else now. And you're not fulfilling what God wants, that we focus on God. You say, why? Well, well, I pray. I pray in the woods. I pray at home with the family. And I would say, awesome. But you need to have fellowship with other believers in Christ. I would say to you, be careful not to forsake your fellowship with each other. Because if you forsake your fellowship with each other, I can tell you this much, you're not intimate with God. And so do that, and you'll find joy. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you in church this Sunday. Now, next part of this, this verse, or verses, is who is in heaven? Who is in heaven? Our Father is in heaven. But I want you to understand he's not confined to a throne room above. He is sovereign and is over the universe, over all things in heaven and on earth. And I found a couple of verses in Psalm 97, verse 8. It says, Jerusalem, all the cities of Judah, have heard of your justice, Lord, and are glad that you re your reign in majesty over the entire earth and are far greater than other gods. You see, he is not confined. He is sovereign. He is God. Another verse, Psalm 136, verse 2. Praise the true God who reigns over all other gods, for his love lasts forever. This is just to point out that he is sovereign <clears throat> over everything. And, 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 and when you think of heaven, think of universe. Think of how huge the universe is. And you read about it. The Hubble telescope revealed that there are galaxies. But we must understand that he's over it all. He's not confined. He is separate from his creation because he is God. But then when we talk about our Father, he is intimate and wants to have relationship with his creation. So our Father is in control whether you believe it or not. 2020 proved to be insane. No one would say that, hey, that was fun. I want to get that get on that roller coaster again. 
But the fact is, it taught the church a lot of things. First, it taught that we can reach out to people in different, different menus. Like our church is using WOCO. And I thank those who run this station that give us this time. But then YouTube. And then Facebook. And we have three different ways of reaching out to people. That would not have happened if COVID did not come. But I want you to understand is that COVID did come, and I, I know it's real, but when you look at 2021, you may feel uncertain and afraid what's going to come about. But God, your Heavenly Father, who knows your needs, knows what's going to come next. And that's a fact. Next we see, Hallowed be thy name. What does Hallowed mean? It means God is holy. And here, when God is most holy, is when we are conformity to his will. And how do we find his will? Through the word of God. you got to read it. And for Christians who live in disobedience to God, you're taking the name of God in vain. You claim him to be Lord when he's not. Did you ever think that when we think about Jesus as being, or God being Lord, and we do not obey, we dishonor him. We're saying, God, you're, God, you're just, uh, in my mind, thinking, well, you're not essential. I do what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not doing what you want me to do. And, and Jesus is not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only those who do my Father's will, who is in heaven. Paul said, when we eat, drink, and do everything else in the good for the glory of God, that is hallowing God's name, making his name holy. And you know, when you think of it, if we're not trying to make his name holy so he's more holier, he's already holy, period. Now, finally, to hallow God's name is attract others to him. Let your light shine before men, before, before men in such a way that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. So here we have the body of Christ being the body of Christ, going out and meeting and, and meeting needs. Just remember, we gotta be together. And then we need to be dispersed out into our communities because there are people who are desperately in need. And how are they going to see Jesus is by how we live. And, and when we do that, God's name is, is made holy. Not more holy, it's just acknowledging that he is holy. Psalm 34, 3 sums up this teaching. It says, O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Exalt his name. Now we have a couple more before we close. Your kingdom come. Well, we know it hasn't come yet. It will come. But be understanding of this. We know it hasn't come yet, and as his disciples, we know we need to spread the word. But I want you to also understand that when we look at that verse, your kingdom come, why hasn't it come? But we still have issues. Satan, putting people in bondage to sin. And that's still happening. People are doing their whatever they want to do. And they're sinning. And they're living like there's no end to life. And so we know as his disciples that we know that we have neighbors who are in bondage to sin, bondage to fear, bondage to depression, all this stuff. That they need the church. They need people to come alongside. We just can't look at what's going on around us in our town, Oconto, and just say, well, that's their problem. It's not their, it may be their problem, but what do we do? We have an answer to that problem. So it says, your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as in heaven. And I want you to understand that. When he says your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, means that when God's kingdom comes, his will, not if it if he comes, he's going to, and his will will be done. There will be no bargaining with that. His will will be done. And this request assumes that God's will is done in heaven, but not yet on the earth. Sin and rebellion are absent in heaven. But boy, they're not absent on earth. All you have to do is see what's going on even in America. And we can see there's hindrances everywhere. But that doesn't mean that we can't do something about it. So this is another request by God to, to let his kingdom rule on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayers would be to continue a reminder to ourselves to get with the kingdom program. Sadly, too many of us believers live for the weekends and not for Christ. You know, I, want, I, I just want to, when I think about God's kingdom, and I think of what's taking place in Indonesia with the Dem people, my niece and her husband are missionaries from new tribes. I don't know if you follow them on Facebook, but they're teaching them the Bible. They're going through Genesis all the way through Revelation. And they have 500 dim people coming each day. Now you have to ask this question. Why? The Holy Spirit is moving them to receive God's kingdom. To receive Jesus. That's so important to understand that these people walk two hours to get to that place. There's no excuses there. They just go. And, and, and Angie, my niece, says, those roads are mud roads. They're not paved. And they're coming up from the mountains, coming down to this teaching center. 500 of them. And they give them recorders with the messages on it. So pray for the dim people. But here we see God's kingdom. We see what Jesus is doing when we need to acknowledge that and say, how can I be a part? Now, remember who your father is from these few verses. And we'll close with this. He is our father who wants a relationship with us. He wants that. He desires that. He's waiting for that. And, and he reigns over the universe, over all his works. There's nothing that he's not in control of. Remember, his name is holy. We don't make it more holier. It is holy. Next, God is a king with a kingdom that will come. It will come. He will come. And we see that God's will will be done. That's your Heavenly Father. That's the one who loves you. That's the one who says, your Father knows your needs before you even ask Him. So practice this first part. Speak to the Lord. It may be hard at first, but speak to Him. Let Him know. Let Him know that, hey, I'm struggling with prayer. I really don't know how to do this thing. Well, He'll teach you. But more so important, there are people maybe in your church who will help you to pray. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you're our Father. I pray for those who struggle with prayer. Those who struggle with a knowledge of God, knowledge of the word. I pray that you would just, through your Holy Spirit, show them the way. Show them how to do this. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this word. In Jesus' name, amen.